The Monte Carlo 1971 model is probably the most underrated vehicle of the whole saga. Yes, its appearance doesn't say much, especially when compared to the rest of the most important vehicles of the franchise. But the reality is that mechanically, it was a real beast. A little ahead of what we're talking about, let me tell you that this Chevrolet had an engine of more than 800 horsepower. But before we get into the details of its performance, let's talk a little about its history. Unlike the best known models of the saga, this Monte Carlo was not originally built by some petrol head, but it was the same production who decided to create it. The interesting thing about all this is that it was chosen very carefully. The main idea was to present a model that had not yet appeared in the saga, and that could represent the American muscle lovers. In addition, it must be said that it complements very well with the character of Sean Boswell. Recall that in the film, we are told that this is a problematic character, who of course enjoys street racing, and ends up going to live with his father in Japan, thanks to the last race he played in the US, where his vehicle ended up destroyed. The history of the Monte Carlo is quite short, being the vehicle that Sean uses to get around and which he mechanically modified. We have then a kind of sleeper since on the outside it doesn't say much, but it can be easily put on par with the Dodge Viper SRT10. The Monte Carlo years after its launch ended up being cheap cars. These were left aside when compared to other icons of American culture of the time, such as Mustangs, Camaros, Challengers, among several others. It was ignored for being perhaps less sporty than its rivals, but nevertheless had the good fortune to be manufactured a few years before the oil crisis, where the engines used began to be less powerful in order to consume less fuel. Its original engine was a 454 7.4 liters, capable of producing 365 horsepower and 631 newton meters. In short, it was quite a powerful vehicle as well as cheap, and therefore, it would be the perfect choice for a young man like Sean with not exactly a lot of capital available. It wouldn't make much sense for a son raised solely by his mother to be able to buy a high-performance model in his teenage years. Having chosen the perfect vehicle to tell Sean's story, the producers decided that the best way to introduce the character was a street race in which not only does Sean end up getting arrested, but his Monte Carlo ends up being wrecked in an accident and later compacted by the police. In the film, we see how after arguing with the owner of a Dodge Viper SRT10, both cars end up racing in a neighborhood under construction. And of course, they couldn't film a scene with so many crashes with just one vehicle. Recall that this race is not exactly clean, and during the race, Clay, the driver of the Viper, repeatedly crashes into Sean. That is why between 8 and 10 replicas of the main Monte Carlo were built, being one of the vehicles with more copies of the whole saga. And as is customary in the industry, these replicas do not receive the same mechanical modifications as the main vehicle, but only the minimum necessary for filming, among which are of course the aesthetic ones in order to achieve an almost identical resemblance. That's why these copies had mainly modifications in the suspension system. But when it came to the engine, most of them had a factory one, a 5.7 liter small block V8, which delivered a modest 250 horsepower and 468 newton meters of torque. There were even replicas that didn't even have an engine installed. It's also interesting to mention that it's not at all easy to film these type of scenes. Since the idea is to achieve a certain correlation between each shot of the race, and for this it must be taken into account that after each of the crashes, the car must be more damaged than before. Thus, after the crash of the vehicle was very slightly damaged, the scene had to be repeated. But if it was damaged in excess, a new replica had to be used to continue filming. Finally, for the rollover scene, several copies were used, and it was filmed several times and from several angles. The most important versions of this Monte Carlo then were the main one, whose engine was a 572 Bill Mitchell. That is to say a 9.3 liter big block engine which could produce more than 800 horsepower and a secondary vehicle with a slightly smaller engine, a 509 or 8.3 liter that managed to generate 560 horsepower. Interestingly, 
Both engines had valve covers inscribed in such a way as to advertise a somewhat larger displacement of 632 cubic inches, or 10.3 liters. Of course, the latter number is crazy, but the actual engines at 9.3 and 8.3 liters are not exactly small either. The performance of these two main vehicles are not at all disappointing, but rather quite the opposite. The Monte Carlo, whose engine was a 560 horsepower, 8.3 liter, swept 0 to 60 miles per hour in just 4.41 seconds. And it completed the quarter mile in 11.97 seconds, finishing it with the speed of 118 miles per hour or 190 kilometers per hour. And all this taking into account that the tires were intended for a track with several curves, and not for a straight line. The Monte Carlo with a 9.3 liter on the other hand was heavily modified. The suspension, the exhaust system, the brakes, and of course, the engine were all improved. The latter cost around 16 grand and declared about 780 horsepower when using normal fuel. However, when using racing fuel, it easily surpassed 800 horsepower and managed to generate a beastly 1050 newton meters of torque. And although it did not receive, or at least is not known, a real test, we can get some estimates of its performance taking into account the weight of the vehicle of approximately 1,750 kilograms or 3,850 pounds, as well as, of course, the 800 horsepower generated by the engine. It's then estimated around 4 seconds for the 0 to 60 miles per hour, as well as 10.2 seconds for the quarter mile and a final speed in this challenge of 140 miles per hour or 225 kilometers per hour. One of the most criticized aspects of this vehicle, of course, is its appearance, and in particular, its interior. This was called sloppy, and many said it looked unfinished. The reality is that this appearance was not out of laziness, but was just another touch to resemble how a teenager of the time might have it. Likewise, it wasn't shabby either. It had a custom roll cage, several gauges were installed on a metal plate, which replaced the original dashboard, as well as a large steering wheel and new seats. On the outside, we can notice a few modifications. One of these was the front lights, replaced by Hella brand ones. The second modification is the hood, which was made of fiberglass. We could say that in addition to being aesthetic, it also helped the performance, significantly reducing the weight of the car. Finally, the wheels were 15-inch Krager 397s. Once the filming was finished, only five examples survived intact. Most of the replicas were sold in the condition in which they were when the filming was done. And although the whereabouts of several of these are unknown, it is thought that they were distributed around the world. One of the cars is in France, in Movie Cars Central, a museum that collects several of the cars from the movie industry. In 2015, another one of the replicas was published for 100,000 USD, and sometime later, it managed to sell for 61,440 USD. Another one of the copies went to the Volo Museum. This one eventually received some upgrades and ended up being published for sale for 40 grand. Another Monte Carlo is in the Velvet Collection of the Celebrity Car Museum. And the last one whose whereabouts are unknown is one of the Universal theme parks. The Monte Carlo is undoubtedly one of the most underrated cars of the saga, with much more potential than it might seem. Several of those who drove it said it was a brutal vehicle, and it was one of the fastest in the early films. It ends up being a reminder that it doesn't matter how shiny your car is, it's all about what's under the hood and who's behind the wheel.